Okay, the book of Hebrews. Um, what, what I'd like to invite us to do um, together today is to, um, to enter uh, maybe a little more deeply into loving God with our minds. Um, you know, the Lord said to love him with all our uh, heart, strength, body, soul, spirit, and mind. And, um, uh, you know, that we're going to get into some stuff that's, that's pretty heady um, and, and touches on some, some theological issues, which have been, uh, you know, they've been debated ever since uh, uh, the first century. Um, but, but I feel really comfortable getting into this stuff with you guys because I know you guys pretty well. I know that you are are really serious Bible students and that you're you're um you really dig into God's word and you and you are the kind of people that think uh really deeply and I and I do think that God wants us to exercise our minds. So that's um that, that's the invitation <laughs> today is to uh love God with with all your mind as we take a look at this central theme in Hebrews uh, which has to do with with um, what our Catholic friends would call the mystery of the cross, and and I like that term because ultimately uh, it, it is a mystery. Um, I think we can press more deeply into the mystery. You know, I think maybe an analogy uh, might be um, um, the things that that scientists are discovering, for example, in in outer space, you know, learning, learning about black holes and dark matter and that sort of thing. Um, th these kinds of things are, are a mystery, uh, but um, people are pressing more deeply into it. When it comes to the cross, I don't think that we will ever, at least in this life, get to the place where we've, we, we like understand it completely and now we've got it down and, um, uh, you know, we can we can write a simple paragraph about it. Uh, I, I think it's one of those things that is so, I think it is the thing that is so deep and so glorious and so magnificent uh, that that we're probably going to spend, uh, we could spend, I know, the rest of our lives and, and maybe uh, the rest of eternity uh, pressing in to what the cross is all about. Um, I think that the book of Hebrews hints at the answers, at some of the answers, not doesn't give complete answers, but hints at some of the answers uh, to these um, questions which, which people have been asking, as I said, for over 2,000 years. Uh, why did Jesus die? Why did he have to die? Uh, we know that he did. Uh, we know that uh, he was buried and that he rose again. We know that's miraculous. We know something happened. But what was it? What was it really about? And related to that, uh, where was God the Father when He died on the cross? Why didn't God the Father step in and intervene or prevent this? Wasn't there there some other way to you know work out whatever was needed to be worked out? And then the final question, which uh, Hebrews also, uh, in fact, Hebrews I think um, uh, sometimes seems to hint. Uh, in answer to the question, can we lose our salvation? Uh, there are some passages in Hebrews, um, those um, warning passages that we talked about last week. Um, there are some passages that, that taken by themselves would lead us to the conclusion that, boy, we'd better watch out. We're on thin ice. Um, and then there's other passages in Hebrews which seem to be saying, no, don't worry about it. The ice is real thick. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that question uh, probably comes up for a lot of people as they're studying the book of Hebrews. Uh, so what we're kind of inviting, uh, what we're being invited to do is to, to press a little more deeply into knowing that which is ultimately unknowable. We know that something radical happened on Good Friday something shook the entire cosmos. All of creation was changed because of what Jesus did on Good Friday. But what was that something that was radical? Uh, what, what was it that happened? 
Um, and what, what was it that began then is, and is being worked out? And I think in order to answer that, before we actually get into the text itself, we, we need to understand some things about sacrifices in the ancient Near East. I abbreviate ancient Near East, A-N-E, just because ancient Near East is a lot to write out. Um, sacrifices in the ancient Near East. And we, we need to understand that all the ancient Near Eastern nations used blood sacrifices to appease the gods. All of them did. That was the water that they swam in. That was the air that they breathed, you know. Um, and all of them, with the exception of Israel, and this is one of the things that set Israel apart from all the other ancient Near Eastern nations, and also one of the reasons why um, the other nations around Israel looked askance at them and thought they were really strange and really weird people, you know. Uh, all the other nations believed in multiple gods, and all the other nations believed that the gods uh, got together and created people, human beings. And the reason they created them was to have slaves. All the ancient Near Eastern uh, nations believed that. Now, they had different myths, and they had different names for their gods, and they had all these different uh, stories about uh, how they came about creating them and all that. But the thing that they had in common was that they all believed in multiple gods. They all believed that the gods created people to be their slaves and that the people uh, were uh, human beings existed primarily to house the gods and to feed the gods. And in exchange for that, the gods would protect the people uh, and, you know, protect their crops and their agriculture. So, uh, you know, if your enemy attacked you, as long as my God is bigger than than their God, um, then we're gonna we're gonna be okay. We're gonna win the battle. As long as uh, my God or my gods are happy, um, I'm gonna get a good harvest of crops, and the weather's gonna cooperate, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was an exchange. Uh, created the people as slaves. You build us houses. You feed us, and we'll protect you. Was basically the thing. Um, this is what theologians call um, a a um, um, an accommodation, a divine accommodation. Um, God, the true and the living God, meets us where we are and works with us. So God met Israel in that context. The nation of Israel believed, in, or was surrounded by nations that believed in many gods and believed that they had to house them and feed them and all that kind of thing. Well, God worked with that. He didn't just come to Israel and say, look, everybody else is completely wrong. Uh, let's just wipe them off the earth and you guys run everything. He takes people where they are, and then he leads them deeper. That's, that's divine accommodation. It's God reaching down to our level. And that's what the author of Hebrews is referring to, and here again, if you have your Bible, you might want to look at uh, chapter 10 in the book of Hebrews, the first seven verses or so. The point of those verses is that the Old Testament, the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the Old Testament, the law, is a shadow of the true which is to come. So, of course, we know, you know, from our perspective and what we know about God is that God doesn't need us to build him a house and God doesn't need to be fed. And, you know, God makes those kind of things very, very clear and specific in the scripture. Remember uh, when he says to the nation of Israel, look, I, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. If, if I was hungry, do you think I'd ask you, you know, um, and uh, even even the elaborate temple that Solomon built for him, you know, God is saying, well, you know, I, I, your heart's right and thanks, but but I don't, I don't need this. God doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands. And uh, here you are, like all the nations around you, and you're offering all these animal sacrifices, but that's never going to remove sin. So all of that is a shadow of that which is to come. What God is looking for 
is contrite hearts. He's looking for honesty. He's looking for humility. Uh, a contrite heart you will not despise, Psalm 51 says. And uh, look there at Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 5, which says, uh, That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You do not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the scriptures. You have given me a body to offer. Now, the author of Hebrews, remember, we don't know who that is, um, is quoting here from the Greek text of Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and then it was translated into Greek. That's called the Septuagint, and it's usually abbre abbreviated with the Roman numerals for 70 because there were 70 scholarly elders that made the translation. And so the author of Hebrews is quoting from the Old Testament. I just point that out because if you go back and read Psalm 40, it's going to sound a little bit differently. Um, that's because the author of Hebrews is quoting from the Greek text, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God the Father, you don't want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but instead you've given me a body. God became flesh in the person of Jesus. You have given me a body in order that I might offer it back to you. Now, there's an important principle there uh, that really applies to all of us. Everything we have is a gift from God. And therefore, it is a privilege to offer what we have back to God. So God's given you some energy. God's given you a talent or two. You know, God's given you some abilities. You offer those back to God. And then the scripture goes on, you, God, were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. But then I said, this is Jesus speaking, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. So uh, we know that God's not impressed with all these blood sacrifices that we read about, for example, in the book of Leviticus. Um, God accommodated. God worked with the people at that level. That's what everybody was doing. That's what they were used to doing. That's what they thought they had to do. Uh, and, and, and God didn't just jump in and go, no, 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 the whole thing's wrong. Uh, that would have been just way too radical for them to accept. The world they lived in was, was a world where you, you offered sacrificial animals to appease the gods. <laughs> And so God accommodated them. But now that Jesus has come, the author of Hebrews is looking back at that and is saying that God never, that wasn't God's perfect will to begin with. The perfect will was for God to become human in the person of Jesus and offer himself as a sacrifice. Um, there's a translation of the story of Abraham uh, when he was called upon by God to offer his son Isaac. Um, and uh, in, in one of the translations, uh, Isaac says to his father, and Isaac, by the way, was like 30 years old at the time. He, he looks at his father as they're walking up that mountain. And he says, well, we, I, we've got the wood for the fire and we've got the knife to kill the sacrifice. And we've got uh, you know, a torch, we've got fire to set the wood on fire, but where's the sacrifice? And uh, several of the translations, uh, it's translated differently in different texts, but uh, one of the translations says, uh, has Abraham saying to Isaac, God will provide himself a sacrifice. So that brings me to the question of when we look at the cross, we're seeing God in human flesh offering himself as a sacrifice. And that brings up the question in my mind, why did Jesus need to die? 
And I think there's several answers to that. First of all, we know, and this is probably what you would have answered right off the bat, he died to save us. Um, and by us, I mean all of us. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 says, because of God's grace, Jesus died for everyone. Because of God's grace, Jesus died for everyone. Now, there are some people, some, you know, good Christian people, um, um, going to be with the Lord forever. <laughs> there are brothers and sisters um, uh, who believe in a doctrine which is called limited atonement. And uh, it, it, it's, it's the doctrine of the Reformed tradition. It's a doctrine in the Calvinistic tradition. And it basically says that Jesus did not die for everyone, that Jesus only died for his elect. And some of those folks would say, and, and in addition to that, there are percentage-wise very few elect. The vast majority of people were not elected by God uh, they're going to be separated from God forever. There's nothing they can do about it. And, but God uh, had uh, sent his son to die on the cross for this chosen group of people. And, oh, thank God I'm part of it. You know, uh, I don't think that's biblical. Uh, I mean, again, look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Because of God's grace, Jesus died for everyone. Not, not just for a select group, but for everyone. Every human being has been created by God and bears the image of God. And the scripture is very plain that God is not willing for any to perish. He wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And of course, probably the most famous verse in the New Testament, John 3, 16, literally says, For God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the cosmos, the, the word that's normally translated world there, means all of creation. God's love reaches to the ends of creation, if there are any ends. God's love is infinite. And God loves you infinitely. I know I'm getting a little bit off track here, but I, I just want to belabor that for just a moment. God loves you infinitely. And that doesn't take away from his love for anybody else because you can't divide uh, infinity, you know. God can love you with an, an infinite love and he can love me with an infinite love and he can love the guy next door with an infinite love. God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only begotten son. Um, coming back now to um, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, glance down at verse 14. For by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the word that's translated perfected means to accomplish completely. So whatever Jesus did on the cross, he, he, he accomplished the task completely. He's done all that is necessary in order for us to be sanctified. The word sanctified means to be set apart to God, to belong wholly and completely to God. But how does Jesus' death save us? Jesus came to die for us. His death saves us. But how does it do that? I mean, after all, in the Old Testament, God forgives people without any blood sacrifice. In the Old Testament, uh, in the Psalms and in the, in the uh, prophets, uh, God says, I don't even want those blood sacrifices. Um, and, you know, there's a verse here in uh, the book of Hebrews, which, which is, uh, I, I hear it misquoted all the time. And that is the verse that says, uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That's only half the verse. Uh, read the whole thing. It says, in the law, forgiveness without the shedding of, uh, of blood. It's saying that under the covenant of the Old Testament Torah, the Old Testament law of Moses, there has to be these blood sacrifices. But then you have God in Psalms and God in 
you know, speaking through the prophets saying, I, that, that, I, I was accommodating you guys, but I, that's not, I didn't really want that to begin with. So it wasn't necessary for Jesus to shed his blood in order for us to get forgiven. Why can't God just say, I, I, look, I see you're sorry, I forgive you. Does his death rescue us from something? Did Jesus' death on the cross somehow change God the Father's attitude? You know, sometimes I hear preachers say things that kind of give you that impression. It's kind of like, you know, God's really ticked off at you and he'd, he'd really like to squish you like a bug. Uh, but Jesus is, is there kind of talking him out of it and going, look, look, Dad, wait, 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 you know, look what I went through for him, you know, let him off the hook. Is that what's really going on in the cross? Jumping back to chapter two. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, uh, the children share flesh and blood, he himself, God, likewise shared the same things so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So what did Jesus do on the cross? Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? What happened? We know that the, everything changed on Good Friday, but, but what? What occurred there uh, other than the fact that an innocent man died? Uh, and, and that's happened before and that's you know happened since. Um, well, what happened was that evil, and by evil, I mean all the sin, all the chaos, all the spiritual darkness, everything that is evil in the entire universe was focused on Jesus when he was hanging on that cross. And, as, and he absorbed it within himself and it imploded. What Jesus did on the cross primarily was he defeated the devil. Remember, take us back to the book of Genesis the very first prophecy about the coming of Jesus right after Adam and Eve sin and, and God confronts them. And, you know, uh, you, you remember that whole scene there. And God says to Eve, um, your, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he says, your offspring is, is going to be attacked by the devil, the serpent, but he's going to crush his head. He's going to defeat the enemy. So ultimately, the purpose of the cross is to destroy the devil's power. Death, according to the scripture, is just a shadow. A shadow can't hurt you. A shadow means in order for there to be a shadow at all, there's got to be light behind it. That, that's why the psalmist in Psalm 23 um, can, can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's just a shadow. It can't hurt you. There's light behind it. And, of course, uh, our scripture here in Hebrews sa says that uh, Jesus died in order to destroy the works of the devil. Uh, John says the same thing in 1 John chapter 3. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And if you had asked uh, pretty much any ordinary Christian uh, in the first 300 years of church history, um, why Jesus died on the cross, uh, she would have responded to you by saying to destroy the works of the devil. That, that was the heart of the early Christians understanding of what the cross was all about. So when Jesus died on the cross, uh, something drastic happened. Now that something is still being worked out. It's still, it, it's an event that's still reverberating through the universe. But when he died on the cross, the devil was defeated. The victory was won once and for all. So this is a bit of a tangent, but everybody wants to know, okay, well, what happens when a believer dies? Or more specifically, what happens to me when I die? 
and the answer to that is that Jesus is there with you. Jesus is there with you. We don't know a lot of the details, but we do know that the moment you take your last breath on earth, you will simultaneously be taking your first breath in the presence of Jesus. And the moment you close your eyes for the last time here on earth, you will for the first time be gazing directly into the face and the eyes and the love of Jesus. We know that when a believer dies, Jesus is there. Jesus said that God the Father is with every dying sparrow. There's another verse that's often misquoted. We usually misquote it by saying, Bible says that God knows about every dying sparrow. That's not what Jesus said. It's true. God does know about every dying sparrow. God knows about everything. But what he's saying is much more profound than that. He's saying God is with that little bird as its little heart beats its last beat. He's there, as it were, cupping his hands around it, gently loving it, uh, carrying it gently out of this life. How much more he loves you. So when a believer dies, Jesus is there with you. I guarantee that. And I guarantee that you're safe, you're alive, and you're conscious. We know that from Scripture. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the Bible says. We also know that when Jesus comes again at his appearance, at the parousia, the, the, the appearance of Jesus, what we would often call the second coming, at that time, God will resurrect our bodies, and at the same time that he's doing that, he's going to recreate the entire physical universe and everything in the entire universe, or multiverses if there's more than one, <laughs> will be absolutely perfect and God will be at the center of all things. And there won't be any darkness, there won't be any evil, there won't be any uh, sin, uh, there won't be anything, any anything that can can spoil that perfect creation allowed in it ever, ever again. And you know, uh, people regularly, and I'm one of these people, I think, well, resurrection of the body, how's that going to work? You know, the body decays. And after all, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm told by uh, physiologists that, that there's not a single physical cell in our bodies that was there seven years ago. You know, the cells in our bodies are continually dying off and splitting and reproducing and making new ones and all. Um, I don't know how God's going to do it, but I do know that we will be physically resurrected from the dead at the second coming of Jesus. So those are things that I'm absolutely sure of because the Bible makes it plain. Another question comes up when we think about the cross, and that is, is God the Father responsible for it? Uh, and, and here again, uh, some of us, I, I, I think the problem lies with some of us preachers <laughs> because we have, and, and, and I'm one of them, have, have given people the impression that God the Father was just so furious with sin that, it, that he just, he, he was like lost control of himself and he, and he has to take it out on, he's got to beat up somebody and he, he's ready to pounce on you and me. And then Jesus jumps in and says, says, no, beat me up instead. And the father pummels Jesus to, to a bloody mess until he's exhausted his, his anger. And then he says, well, okay, now I'm satisfied. <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But that's the way the cross is presented sometimes. Uh, did God the father kill Jesus? The short answer to that is no. Uh, the greatest empire in the world got together with the greatest religion that the world had ever known, and the two of them combined forces to kill Jesus. That, that's who killed him, you know. Um, but that brings us to these various ways of looking at the cross, looking at, the, uh, at what Jesus did on the cross. And, and these are what theologians call atonement theories. And... Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I know you guys, uh, some of you just, you, you can really geek out on this stuff. 
Um, and I encourage you to, I mean, you know, I, I, I totally geek out on it, <laughs> but, um, so, and I'm not going to do that today. Uh, but these are the major ways historically that people have viewed the cross. Uh, the first one is called Christus Victor, which means Christ the victor or um, victory through Christ. It's the classical view of the atonement. It's the oldest view of the atonement. It's what uh, people assumed and held uh, for the first couple of hundred years of church history. Uh, and basically it says that Jesus died on the cross to defeat evil, to defeat the devil, to defeat sin, to defeat death, and to release us, and but not just us, all of creation, all of nature, uh, from the bondage of sin, to release us from the curse. All of creation's been under a curse since the fall. Uh, now Jesus died on the cross to release us from that. Um, if you want a great description of the Christus Victor view, uh, it would be C.S. Lewis's view in the, in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, you know, which is a children's story, but uh, has that, that beautiful scene where Aslan, who represents Jesus, uh, willingly gives himself as a sacrifice, and then there's a deep magic which transforms everything, and the, the stone altar splits in half, and Aslan comes back to life, and the the uh, um, wicked witch, you know the the uh, 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 what is she? The Snow Queen. Uh, she or, or or maybe that's uh, the Nutcracker Suite. Anyway, uh, anyway, the witch and the lion, the witch in the wardrobe. Uh, she loses all her power, and and spring comes to the land, and all the creatures that she turned into stone come alive, and so forth. And that's a beautiful picture of. Uh, Christus Victor. Uh, in the third century, uh, Origen came along and he um, articulated what has come to be called the ransom theory, um, that we were in bondage to Satan and Jesus died on the cross in order to uh, uh, pay off Satan, as it were, to ransom us, to buy us uh, out of slavery so that we could be free. Uh, Augustine, or Augustine, if you prefer, in the fifth century articulated the moral influence theory. He said Jesus' teachings and example positively change humanity. And we keep moving on through history, and we come to the Middle Ages, the 11th century, and Anselm articulates what is called the satisfaction theory, that Jesus' death on the cross satisfies the justice of God. A couple of centuries later, Luther and Calvin, the leaders of the Protestant Reformation, took that a step further and came up with what is called the penal substitution theory. And basically what they taught was that God is satisfied, uh, God's justice is satisfied, because Jesus took our punishment, the punishment we deserve, upon himself. Um, in the 18th century, 1700s, 18th century, uh, the governmental theory uh, was put forth. It's primarily Methodist. And it says that Jesus died to show God's displeasure with sin. And then a very modern theory, uh, which has been forth, put forth by uh, Rene Girard and James Allison and others, and actually also by uh, uh, Pope Benedict, is, is the scapegoat theory that says that Jesus was a victim of injustice and that um, the ultimate victim of injustice, and then they work that, that out. Now, um, those are the major atonement theories. There's, there's lots of subdivisions and other things, so you can find lists of 10 or 12 or whatever, but those are the major ones. But uh, notice something about these. I think they're all true, <laughs> you know? Uh, I, I think that Jesus obviously was a victim of injustice. It was a horrible, gross injustice. I think that his death on the cross 
pointedly shows that God is displeased with sin. I think properly understood, the penal substitution theory uh, is, is correct and is what the Bible teaches, that God is satisfied because Jesus took our punishment. The only problem with the penal substitution theory that, that I, uh, from my perspective, is that some of us have presented it as if, um, like kind of the way I described before, that, that, that God was filled, God the Father is filled with fury and anger at our sin, and, and his justice requires that, that he, he kill somebody, and so he kills Jesus instead of us. Uh, I, that's where it gets off base, I think. Um, I think that the um, judgment for our sins is the nat nat uh, those are the natural consequences of the sin that we commit. And I do believe that Jesus took all of that upon himself. I do believe that he took all the punishment that the universe can deal out uh, for our sins. But, but I, I I don't think it was I don't think it was on an opposite side from God the Father. Uh, I think for God the Father so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So properly understood, I think penal substitution is biblical and correct. Um, certainly, I think Jesus, as Anselm said, satisfied uh, the the justice of God. Um, I also think that uh, Augustine was correct when he said that Jesus' teachings and example positively change humanity. And I think that Origen was correct when he talked about um, Jesus purchase, purchasing us out of slavery and setting us free. I think all of that is at least what I mean. I, I would put all of that under the umbrella of Christus Victor. I would say yes to all of that. Jesus died to defeat evil, to defeat sin, to defeat the devil, to defeat death, to release creation from bondage. Uh, he, he has purchased us out of slavery. He set us free. Um, his death on the cross is an example um, that uh, uh, positively changes uh, humankind. Um, he has satisfied the justice of God. He's taken any punishment that we deserve. Uh, he clearly is displeased with sin, and he clearly was a scapegoat. I think it all uh, falls under that one big umbrella. Those are all; those are descriptions of the things that happened on Good Friday. Somehow, all of that was put into motion. So, where was the Father? when Jesus died on the cross. Yeah, and you remember famously, Jesus cried out, Eli, I, Eli lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God the Father forsake his son? Was the, was the Trinity somehow split? Was there a rupture in the Trinity so that part of the Trinity was no longer in contact with the rest? Or was Jesus simply articulating what he felt? Where was God the Father when Jesus was hanging on that cross? He was right there alongside, although Jesus couldn't see him, Jesus couldn't feel him, Jesus couldn't hear his voice for a time. He was right there, and I believe with all my heart that God the Father was weeping. I think it broke God the Father's heart not to intervene, but he didn't intervene because he loves you and me as much as he loves Jesus. Did you hear what I said? In John chapter 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer, he prays that we would come to understand that God the Father loves us with the same love with which he loves him. God so loves you that he gave his only begotten son. Remember when Jesus was baptized in the you know, the heavens were open and the Spirit of God came upon him like a dove. And there was an audible voice that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God is saying the same thing about you. He's saying exactly the same thing about you. 
You are his beloved daughter. You are his beloved son. And he's pleased with you. He's not necessarily pleased with every single thing that you've ever done or that you are doing. <laughs> but he's pleased with you as a person. You are precious in the sight of the living God. Which brings me to this final question for, for our study today, and that is, can Christians lose their salvation? Uh, again, uh, come back with me to Hebrews chapter 10, and I pick it up in verse 9, where the author says, Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good works. I, I like that phrase, provoke one another to love and good works. We, we normally think of being provoked as a negative thing. But we can prod one another towards love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. The day being the parousia, the appearance of Jesus, the coming of Christ back to the earth. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, I'll talk more about this in a future study, but what he's talking about is we have confidence to enter into intimate fellowship with God, confidence to enter into the heart of God, into an intimate relationship with God, knowing that God loves us, knowing that God is going to receive us. So can we lose that? Well, we were created with free will, and we can choose our path. Being, having free will is part of being created in the image of God. And I think the scripture, and again, let's, you know, there are good Christian people, I love them, good brothers and sisters. Maybe they're right, maybe I'm wrong, it's okay. <laughs> but it seems to me from the scripture uh, that if we consistently choose to reject God, who is the only source of love throughout our entire lives, and, and maybe even out into the next life, I don't know. But if we consistently reject, then we have put ourselves outside of the reach of love. So in that sense, I guess the answer would be yes. But on the other hand, we're safe. God will not let you go. You're safe and secure. Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. God's got you. You're safe. You're secure in God. Besides that, God is a God of great compassion, great care, great empathy. Uh, in our Hebrews text back in chapter 2, picking it up in verse 16, for it is clear that he did not come to help angels. Jesus didn't come to help out angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham, he came to help people. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect. He was tempted like us so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. God became human in the person of Jesus. He faced temptations. He faced the hardships of life. He understands not just in a theoretical sense, 
uh, not even just in a sympathetic sense, but he has deep empathy for whatever it is that you're going through. When you're going through a hard time, he's been there. He understands. He's with you in it. Now, if you're like me, you would rather him just uh, take you around the difficulty or over it or something. But then occasionally he does. But most of the time, he walks with us through it. He's there with you. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He will never leave you. He will never be forsaken. Now, it is true, of course, that we're all going to be judged. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the scripture says. And it's also true that grace doesn't mean you just get to do whatever you feel like doing without any consequences. Uh, that, you know, that's absurd. Uh, we are going to be judged, but don't be afraid of the judge. He's the same one who loved you so much that he died on a cross for you. And you know, as he was hanging on that cross, and I, I can't prove this from scripture or anything else, but I, I'm, I'm personally convinced um, that as he was hanging on that cross, he was thinking about you. He's God. He created you. He knew all about you 2,000 years ago. He knew everything you'd go through. He knew when you're going to fall and stumble and fail. He knew all that stuff. And as he was hanging on that cross, he stayed there until every sin you've ever committed was atoned for. If you had been the only person who had ever sinned, Jesus would have come and died on that cross just for you. So, yes, it's in part of our part of following Jesus means that we are obeying Jesus. Uh, you know, it's kind of like I've, I've used this illustration before, but uh, if if we were say we had an appointment in a in an office building downtown, you know, and and let's say that while we're there, um, the, the, there's a big fire in the building, and the hallways are filled with smoke, and the alarms going off, and you know, people are panicking and, and all. But there's, there's one person there in the office. Uh, and, and she gets up and she says, folks, calm down. I know the way out. Uh, I'm, I, I'm a safety officer. Uh, I've got a flashlight here. And uh, just follow me and we'll get out of this burning building. If you're going to follow her, it means you would have to get up and follow her. <laughs> You know, <laughs> are you with me? It wouldn't do you any good to sit there in the burning building and say, I believe in that person. I believe she's a safety officer. I believe she knows the way out. Yes, sir. I believe that. And I'm going to sit right here and get burnt up. Following Jesus means following Jesus. It means doing what he said. None of us do that perfectly, but we don't need to be afraid of God. Your core identity is beloved. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And when he calls you to obey, uh, that's, that's, you're, you're obeying ultimate love. You're not obeying some abusive tyrant. So don't be afraid of the judge. The judge is the same one who died on the cross for you. And if you're like me and there are things in your past that, that you feel ashamed of, you feel guilty about, please know that sin is gone forever. And the psalmist said, as far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. The prophet Micah, speaking to God, said, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. God, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, said, I I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. And then, of course, we have that beautiful promise in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sit with those promises and let them soak in. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Blotted out our transgressions. 
God says, I don't even remember your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are in the process of being transformed by the blood of Christ. Something glorious happened on Good Friday. Something that shook the foundations of the whole universe. Something that's reverberating now throughout the universe. We don't yet see it complete. But it's happening and we will see it complete. Mm, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, how much more than the animal sacrifices, this is what he's talking about, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience, conscience from dead works to worship the living God? You are safe, you're secure, you're in God's hands, and he is by his Holy Spirit, sometimes painfully slowly, forming you into his perfect likeness. You already bear his image. Every human being bears his image. And now that you've received Jesus, now that you're a follower of Jesus, he is making you more like Jesus every day. One of the truths that the psalmist brings forth is that everybody worships something. And without exception, all of us human beings are becoming like whatever we worship. So if your God is cruel, you're becoming more and more cruel. If your God is insensate, you're becoming more and more insensate. If your God is greedy, you're getting more and more greedy. But if your God is Jesus, you're becoming more like Jesus every day. And that's our prayer. God, make me more like you today than I was yesterday. And if you give me tomorrow, make me more like you tomorrow than I am today. Each day, another step closer to Jesus. So where does this journey begin? It begins by us accepting the fact that even though we're sinners, our core identity is beloved. Even before we can understand ourselves. See, I can't really look honestly at myself. I can't really face my shadow self unless I'm convinced that God loves me unconditionally. Because if I'm not convinced that God loves me unconditionally, uh, I'll look at myself and I'll, I'll see things that, that are terrifying and, and it'll lead me in despair. But if I'm convinced that I am beloved just as I am, then... I can be free and open and I can come to God and say, Lord, search me and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. And, and I'm, not, I'm not worried about what the answer is going to be. I'm not worried that God's going to say, well, now that you ask, you're a worthless piece of junk and I'm going to you know, toss you into the fire. No, God says, you're, you are my beloved child. And I am molding you, I'm shaping you into my image. Your core identity is beloved. Oh, God, help us to let that sink within. If, if you can, and invite you to stick around for a few minutes, and we're going to break up into breakout groups. And I invite you to, to talk about these things, uh, to, to think about, what does salvation really mean? I mean, I'm, I know it means your sins are forgiven and you get to be with Jesus when you die. Uh, that's a given. And praise God for that. But, and that's, but that's a given. Let's just set that aside for a moment. What does salvation mean? What did Jesus' death on the cross mean for the greater society in which we live? Maybe you'd like to talk about that. And maybe you'd like to think about as you meditate on the cross, what is it that really speaks to your heart? So I'm going to stop recording and I invite you to uh, stick around and we'll spend the, oh, you know, 10 minutes or so chatting about those things and then 
come back together and touch base and see how we're doing.